Hello and welcome to a summary of all you need to know about the poem Disabled by Wilfred Owen. Now, I will read and explain the meaning related to this poem as well as important language devices and contextual factors that you need to understand when it comes to Wilfred Owen himself. So let's get started. Now, I'll read the first three stanzas and then start pointing out interesting literary techniques that you need to highlight and emphasise when writing about this poem. He sat in a wheelchair, waiting for dark, and shivered in his ghastly suit of grey, legless, sewn short at elbow. Through the park, voices of boys rang, saddening, like a hymn, voices of play and pleasures after day, till gathering sleep had mothered them from him. About this time, town used to swing so gay when glow lamps budded in the light brief trees and girls glanced lovelier as the air grew dim, in the old times, before he threw away his knees. Now he'll never feel again how slim girls' waists are, or how warm their subtle hands. All of them touch him like some queer disease. There was an artist silly for his face, for it was younger than his youth last year. Now he's old. His back will never brace. He's lost his colour very far from here, poured it down shell holes till the veins ran dry, and half his lifetime lapsed in the hot race, and leap of purple spurted from his thigh. Now, in this verse, these first three verses, we are introduced to this anonymous war veteran. Now, the title already is quite interesting. It's a metonym and it really replaces the wholeness of his identity. Now, contextually, do remember that Wilfred Owen is a soldier poet. So he served in the First World War and unfortunately also lost his life. However, he also, before he lost his life in the First World War, he actually got massively injured and also suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder. And a lot of his poetry was written whilst he was recovering, whilst he was convalescing in hospital. So. It's interesting this title because perhaps this could also reflect Wilfred Owen's own feelings once he was convalescing, once he was recovering and how he was treated by the society that he was in. Now, the opening pronoun, he, shows us that this soldier is anonymous and in many ways this could be Wilfred Owen's way of universalising the experience of many other war veterans, how they are treated and how they're really forgotten about by society, the same society that they essentially risked their lives and lost everything for. Furthermore, there's a sense of stasis and passivity when we learn that he sat in a wheelchair. This war veteran, perhaps he's quite old now, he's now sitting in this wheelchair and he's essentially been forgotten by the rest of the world after he sacrificed everything in war to serve his country. Furthermore, the caesura really slows down the pace of this first stanza. It shows that everything is very slow for this aging veteran. Moreover, there's a semantic field of darkness that's used here, dark and grey, and what this shows is that this soldier, or rather this war veteran's existence, is quite nihilistic. There's nothing that he's looking forward to. There's almost no reason to him still living. Moreover, the simile, like a hymn, shows that the voices that he can hear, it's almost like a sad song for him. It's mourning him. It's mourning his lost youth when he used his youth at the war, but also his lost older years when he's now isolated in this old veteran shelter. Now, the sibilance sewn short shows how, and it emphasises how he's disabled. He's lost some of his limbs. Furthermore, it's really interesting to look at the enjambement that's used in this verse and it shows how the voices are almost wafting through. It runs into the next line almost like these voices are wafting through and piercing his quiet existence. Furthermore, the repetition of voices suggests that he, he only this anonymous veteran can hear this. He, maybe these are voices in his head. He's remembering this distant past. Furthermore, the alliteration, play and pleasures, show that he is excluded from this happiness, he's excluded from this social interaction, and he all he can do is watch from afar. But also, what this could be, are the part of the voices that are ringing in his head, he's reflecting and reminiscing on the happiness he used to have. Moreover, sleep is personified as mothering them from him. And this shows that sleep is a very comforting escape for him. It's only in sleep that he can find respite. He can remember the good days when he was young and he used to be treated quite kindly by society. 
Now in the second verse, there's a temporal focus this time. And of course, this is emphasized with alliteration. And now we go back to the past and how the town used to be really happy. And we're told through the intensifier so to show how positive his past used to be when he was young. And of course, do you remember that the word gay in this context means happy? Also, the description of the light blue trees which are budding shows his carefree youth. This is a metaphor for his carefree youth. And the alliteration, girls glanced, highlights the promise of youth when girls used to look at him and when he felt like a man. Now, the antithetical uh, terms old times versus now this shows the contrast in the temporal shift so he's thinking about the old times the good old times however we then fast forward in line 11 to the present and how in the present he feels terrible he will never again feel this positive feeling and he never will be seen as this masculine young man by the girls also, there's this interesting term, he threw away his knees, and this shows that his decision to enlist was perhaps quite careless, his decision to go and serve in the First World War, he didn't even think about it, he didn't understand the massive consequences that would be associated with him serving in war. Moreover, he, uh, the term knees is synecdoch, and of course this represents his whole body, he's essentially become disabled. Furthermore, there's a semantic field of body parts related to the girls, waists and hands, and it shows how he misses being able to move in an agile way, but also he misses the intimacy from women. Also, the simile, like some queer disease, shows how he's now ostracized by society as a disabled war veteran. Moreover, the comparative adjective younger focuses on his vitality as a young person and there's this oxymoron, youth versus old, which flashes forward to his aged body versus how young and agile he used to be as a young man. Furthermore, the metaphor, poured it down in shell holes, shows that he gave his youth up, his life up to the war. He almost took his life in a bottle and poured it down and really just sacrificed, but he doesn't have anything to show for this sacrifice. Also, the alliteration half his and hot emphasises how he really has lost these years and to some degree probably really regrets it because nobody is really rewarding him for his efforts. So let's carry on. One time he liked to blood smear down his leg after the matches, carried shoulder high. It was after football when he drank a peg. He thought he'd better join. He wonders why. Someone had said he'd look a god in kilts. That's why. And maybe too to please his Meg. Aye, that was it. To please the giddy jilts, he'd asked to join. He didn't have to beg. Smiling, they wrote his lie. Age 19 years. Germans he scarcely thought of. All their guilt and Austrias did not move him. And no fears of fear came yet. He thought of jewelled hilts for daggers and plaid socks, of smart salutes and care of arms and leave and pay arrears, esprit de corps, and hints for young recruits. And soon he was drafted out with drums and cheers. Some cheered him home, but not as crowds cheer goal. Only a solemn man who brought him fruits thanked him and then inquired about his soul. Now, these three verses emphasize the contrast between how when he was quite young, he enlisted for this war almost as, as a joke and almost as a way to prove his masculinity. But then when he came back from the war, there were really not that many people he even waited on him. These crowds that he thought would come, he'd come back to and they'd cheer for his sacrifice. Actually, he only found one man who gave him fruits as a way of a thank you. Now, in this verse, he mentions blood smears. So in other words, Owen mentions blood smears. And this seems like a badge of honor. So he's reflecting on how when he was young, he would, you know, be very, very agile. He'd also play in some dangerous sports, which would cause some kind of pain. However, this was a way to show his prowess. Also, when he refers to after the match's carried shoulder high, this is a specific snapshot memory and it shows post-match celebration. Of course, this is when he was young and he really misses this. Also, the repetition of the third person pronoun, he, he, and he, shows it's really ambiguous here whether he's joining the match or signing up for war. And the caesura functions as a volta as he feels really regretful about enlisting for war. 
Also, we get a colloquial sense of his uh, voice, so when he says I, and this is a term that we usually hear a lot of Scottish people say, so when they're saying yes, they instead say I, and now we see and hear his voice. Also, he talks about the reasons, and really the superficial reasons that enlisted for war, so to please the giddy jilts. And really we learned that he enlisted to gain respect from his peers. He really didn't think about it and think about the massive consequences of serving in war. Furthermore, we learned that it was really easy for him to enlist in the war. He didn't have to beg a lot of young working class men, contextually speaking, in the First World War, and of course also in the Second World War, signed up for war. But after the war, they weren't given adequate treatment, they weren't treated and reintegrated back into society and a lot of them suffered from post-traumatic stress disorder and they were ostracised. Also the present continuous verb here highlights the authorities who, listed, who enlisted him. So they say smiling they wrote his lie. They knew that he was underage, he was too young for war but they still accepted him. Also, there's a mention of Germans and Austria, and these proper nouns refer to the enemy countries, but he didn't really know about this. He just enlisted, didn't realise what he was getting himself into. Furthermore, the adverb scarcely shows he didn't realise the gravity of his actions and what he would lose. Moreover, the capitalisation of this abstract noun, fear, highlights he didn't really fear mortality or death. This is, of course, what comes with youth and agility. You don't necessarily think that you're going to grow old. Furthermore, the mention of jeweled hilts shows the bejeweled handles of swords, and this showed the law of conscription, the glamour that he thought would come with being a soldier. Furthermore, when he mentions for daggers and plaid socks, of smart salutes, care of arms and leave and pay arrears, the Sinderton here shows that he took a superficial interest in participating in war. He didn't actually care about saving his country, but actually if that came with it, then that would be fine. Moreover, the collective noun, crowds shows that some people didn't actually appreciate his sacrifice they didn't wait for him when he came back from war to even thank him just very few people including this man who brought him fruits moreover of course there's this anonymous solemn man this is the only person who really thanked him when he came back so let's look at the final verse now he will spend a few sick years in institutes and do what things the rules consider wise and take whatever pity they may dole. Tonight he noticed how the women's eyes passed from him to the strong men that were whole. How cold and late it is. Why don't they come and put him into bed? Why don't they come? Now of course this final verse is really really sad. It shows just how nihilistic, how negative his life has turned out. So again, there's this temporal shift to his present. He's now a sick old man. He no longer has any of the positives that youth brought him. Furthermore, the adjective shows his hopeless stasis. He isn't moving, he's just literally waiting around for death. Furthermore, the repetition of this conjunction and shows how monotonous and repetitive his life is. And when he notices how women's eyes pass from him to the strong men that were whole, he, this shows this focus on their eyes symbolises their desire and they should of course do not desire him any longer. Furthermore, the idea of this strong man being whole contrasts with the title, which is the metonym, the, dis the idea of disability. And of course, this shows that this man realises that he's really half the person he used to be as a result of being disabled. But of course, this is the wrong attitude to take and especially the wrong way for society to treat him. He's actually more of a man because he risked his life in war. However, society doesn't see it this way. Furthermore, this exclamatory sentence, how cold and late it is, it shows just how old he's become and he's now even very used to a certain pattern of life. Furthermore, the final rhetorical questions, put him into bed, why don't they come, emphasises just how isolated he is and this makes us feel pathos for him. So that's all. If you found this video useful, do make sure you visit our website, which is www.firstratetutors.com. There you will find lots of useful revision materials for this poem and indeed other poems in the International GCSE Anthology. Thank you so much for listening.